Welcome everybody and thank you for, we're off indeed Debbie, thank you for joining us today, um, thank you for joining the Open Ed SIG for one of our webinars and we're delighted to bring you today uh, Maha Bali from Cairo, all the way from Cairo in Egypt, who's going to talk to us about the process she has been engaged in as she prepares for next week's OER 17, so a crucial moment. Um, for the open education community. Great, we have Mark from California. Isn't it something like 3 a.m. in California, Mark? Thank you for coming along. Um, it's wonderful to have uh, so, such uh, a rich community um, and yeah, rich has nothing to do with money, you know, I've discovered that over the years. As I, as I near the age of retirement, I realized that richness is so much more <laughs> than money. As I was mentioning before, this is the year of open, so we're, we're particularly thinking about openness this year more than ever and thinking about how important it is that despite whatever um, local conditions we may have in our contexts, whether it's in our schools or our institutions within our countries nationally, whatever those contexts, education needs to reach beyond borders. Education needs to reach all people and learning and learning opportunities need to reach all people. I'm so overawed with Christian joining us as well. It's wonderful to have you all in the webinar today. Fabulous. So I'm also going to remind you that this week is Open Education Week and this event along with many, many other international events that are happening with a focus on openness um, are listed on the Open Education Week um, website. So please do uh, take a look and explore that. All you have to do is Google Open Education Week or look out for the hashtag Open Education Week um, hashtag open education WUK, WK um, on Twitter as well to see what's going on and to engage and to think and talk about open Francis welcome good to see so many of you here it's really exciting and I'm so glad that we managed to um, boot up the hamsters to get our uh, collaborate room working today thanks to Martin for that so I hope you've made your introductions you've got to meet each other a little bit within the um, chat there and explore the interface a little bit. But here's what we're here for. We're here to meet Maha. Let me tell you a little bit about my own um, uh, experience of meeting Maha because just to give you a little bit of context, I'm sure we've all got stories about how we've met meet Maha as well and do ch share them in the chat. Um, I met Maha through, uh, really through another online um, connection, Simon Enser, who I've worked with for the past few years, um, connecting students for language learning. And Simon is very, very good at networking and he introduced me to Maha. And as I explored and as I read her blog, I really felt I got to know Maha, not just as a person who is passionate about education um, and learning and a person who is open-minded and willing to engage with people beyond her immediate context using digital tools for that, which is maybe not surprising given her, her background in education technology as well. Um, but also I felt through her blog, I felt I was getting to know Maha as a real person. And, and at that point I realized that the virtual connecting part was very um, was really just a bridge into adding yet another exciting and engaging and interesting educator into my uh, wealth of uh, personal learning network that has come uh, with connecting and I'm sure many others have had that experience as well but I have to mention that when I went to alt uh, one year to an alt conference one year Mahan and I, unbeknown to ourselves, were staying in the same hotel. We actually shared a lift on the way to um, Alt one morning and I looked, I looked at this lady and thought, I know you, I know you from somewhere, but I thought, no, 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 I'm, I'm just, I'm thinking that might be Maha, but why would it be? Why would I? 
So, uh, yes, I, I resisted saying anything in a very English way. You know, you don't approach people until you know who they are. Um, and then, of course, we bumped into each other <laughs> for real. And uh, I, I watched Maha present at Alt. And what a fabulous, what a fabulous speaker. And I'm so delighted that she's speaking at OER 17 because I know we're going to learn so much from her. I've learned so much from her already. Um, and I know she's not only a wonderful person, she's a great mum. And, and as many of the women in this room will be very familiar with, and, and the men, let's say, let's not be sexist, she's very used to juggling the demands of career and, um, and children as well. So I'm delighted to, uh, to have her with us today. I'm going to pass over to Maha now and do a quick check and make sure your audio is okay, Maha. And we, we're really excited to hear all about your personal perspective on open practice um, that I know you've been working on using your blog in preparation for the OER 17 keynote next week. So Maha, we can see you. That's lovely. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can indeed. Excellent. Thank you for the very, very, very warm introduction, Teresa. It, it feels very different when you feel like someone introducing you and they actually know you, so they're not just reading off a bio. And I, I love so much what you shared. I did think you were going to talk about the elevator story first before <laughs> before you said how we online, but it actually makes more sense to say how long we've known each other online before I meeting mean, face-to-face. And a lot of the people in this um, chat I've met online, and there's a couple I've met face-to-face -face as well, like Francis. Uh, and I'm really excited to, to be at OER 17 in Um And when, when Teresa invited me to this, I was very honored. And then at the same time, I was like, oh my god, one more presentation to prepare <laughs> ahead of the conference. Um, and then I also realized that I actually have a little bit more time to present this than I have at the keynote itself. <laughs> so I can't preview the keynote or else I could actually just finish saying the entire keynote. So instead, I'm going to talk about my process of doing the keynote. Um, and I am usually okay at looking at the chat while I'm talking, so if you want me to answer something right away, I might notice it and answer it as I go. All right? And that's my Twitter handle in case you don't already um, know it. Uh, and so the first feeling I got when I was invited to OER 17 was I felt like an imposter. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons, I think, for that. It's, it's, I think it's one of those things that most academics have anyway. I think going through a PhD makes you more impostery because you're suddenly given this title that people are supposed to now expect you to be an expert at something, but you're still the same person you were the day before you got your PhD, which was the least senior person in your environment, pretty much, except for the beginner PhD students. Um, but with the OER uh, specifically, I felt very impostery because I knew there were so many other people who had so much more experience with open, who did so much uh, for open, and who, even in terms of activism, do a lot more than I do. And there are a lot of people who have institutional support for open and so are able to do a lot more than I. Um, so this is, uh, this was a, a bit difficult. And, I, and, you know, I keep thinking, oh, my God, will I have, I mean, I was invited, I think, in August or September, so I've had a lot of time to, <laughs> to build up these impostery feelings. And I keep thinking, well, I could be using this time to read more. And then I keep telling myself, no, but they didn't invite me because they wanted me to prepare for the keynote. They invited me because at that moment in time, they thought I would add value to the keynote. And I kept trying to think, what is it that's unique that I've got to add? And I still don't know if what I've got to add is new, but you're going to have to listen to it anyway. <laughs> and if the keynote is, <laughs> whatever comes out of the keynote, I'd love a chance to get to talk to everybody outside of the keynote. And for me, that's, that's the privilege of, of being invited, is that I can get to talk to everybody else outside of my own keynote. Uh, it was fun preparing it, but I think more importantly, just being in the same room as people and being able to um, talk to you afterwards and beforehand, and if you're staying at the hotel and if you're free in the evening, I'd love to sit and talk to people at lunch whenever you guys are free. Um, and so yeah, I did reflect on my own work on open uh, over the last year. And I did realize that I do a few things. And I'll talk about a few of them in the keynote, but more the keynote is going to be about a lot of things that go wrong when we when we go for open, but at the same time trying not to discourage people from trying it even though these mistakes will happen. And a lot of you might have seen my blog post on uh, fixing the shirt which is spoiling the trousers, uh, which is and I, asked, I solicited from people ideas of stories that they can share related to open education or education in general, 
where sometimes trying to fix something creates a different problem, and that sharing these stories will maybe help us all learn from them. Um, and I also started to think about, uh, you know, I had, I've, I've done some work uh, with Suzanne Kotiobo uh, last year on self as OER, and I think in some ways sometimes being open is, is just a, an attitude or a way of being that isn't necessarily something that works for everyone, and that works for me offline as well. And, and so, I, you know, I'm so open that I can barely keep a secret. Like telling me I'm doing a keynote like six months before this keynote is happening and telling me you have to stay quiet about it for three months or something, that was just really, really hard. Uh, and, and what I would do is I would tell some very close people, I have a keynote, but I can't tell you where it is. And I can't tell you what it's about, but I have a keynote. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And I tell people in my face who have no idea what the way you are 17 is, so I just have someone to tell that there's something happening to me. Um, and I'm also so open that every time I had an idea for the keynote, I had to share it. And that means that I um, change my mind a lot because sometimes I share an idea and people give me feedback and then they'll help me change my mind. And so that's, that's actually a pretty cool thing, even though not necessarily the people commenting weren't necessarily going to be the people at the keynote, but it's still helpful to, to, see, to hear what other people think about um, what I'm thinking at the moment, to see how receptive they are. So there was a blog post that I wrote about uh, the Mr. Men and Little Miss series of books, and that got a lot of um, good responses. And, I, and one of the first things I thought on my keynote was something related to that series. Uh, and blogging about it just made me more comfortable going ahead and keeping that in the keynote because I know now that you know this is something that seems to resonate with people, and they won't think I'm being silly. Hopefully, some, I mean, hopefully a lot of people won't think I'm silly. Maybe if you were, but that's okay. Those who have kids uh, or who interact with kids or remember being kids themselves, which hopefully all of us do, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll find something there for them. Uh, so I think I have maybe what, six blog posts or something related to the keynote, uh, one of which uh, Sheila helped me go ahead and write uh, was vanity in the keynote about, you know, what do you wear for the keynote? And right now I'm writing a post for a pro hacker. I collected stories from people about mishaps that have happened to them in keynotes. So people whose luggage got um, lost, like Laura Chernovich, which happened at the LC conference where I met Teresa. Her luggage got lost and she had to go buy new clothes the night before her keynote and things like that. Uh, so I'll, hopefully I'll publish that soon as well. Um, and in general, from what I've said so far, like I, I took a more process orientation towards how I wanted this keynote to look um, and to be and to feel. There's a lot of content in it because I've had six months to prepare. So I have like, I don't know, 50 pages of content or something. The ideas because I have so much time to post quotes and ideas and, and then trying to organize them and trying to make them fit into 35 minutes is actually quite difficult. I speak really fast, as you can see. But um, it's still it's still a lot. And but for me, what was more important is that I don't want to keynote this broadcast. So I don't want to be brought, like, I don't want to talk for 35 minutes like I'm talking right now. Um, and I wanted to have more interaction with the audience. I wanted to have more interaction with the virtual folks. I wanted to have um, a lot of questions, but also a lot of people thinking about what they want to do. Sometimes you go to a keynote and it's hammering so many ideas into your head that you're, you get overwhelmed. And that still might happen in mine, I'm not sure. But I also want, wanted to see that there's a way for people to feel like they're the keynote is useful in some way to them, but it's adding some value. And I've got, at the end of the keynote, I'm, I've got a Google form asking for feedback, for example, for people uh, from what they want, you know, what they found most valuable and what they would have liked to have in the keynote that wasn't there. And during the keynote, I'm going to ask some people, like Christiane and Sheila, actually, who will volunteer some of their stories, to, to actually, I'm just going to walk in with the audience and talk to them about, uh, ask them to share some stories. Um, and I've got, Little, just little things where hopefully people will participate, and then there are other parts where I'm just talking for a stretch because Jude is like, we want to hear you, we don't want to hear everyone else. Um, I don't mind people sharing images of my slides, someone is asking. Oh, I don't want to be broadcast. No, I don't mind being broadcast. I'm on all over YouTube. Uh, Francis was asking about that. No, I'm all over YouTube. I don't mind being broadcast. I mean, I don't want to be one way. That's why I'm not by broadcast. I meant I wanted to be more interactive and participatory, yes. Yeah, that's more of what I mean. So I don't mind people sharing the slides. I've actually got a link that isn't up yet. I scheduled it to appear just before my keynote that has a link to my Google slides that are commentable. So people can post comments on my slides if they don't want to ask a question out loud or if they're virtual. Um, and they could post the comments there and I'll respond to those asynchronously. Obviously, they could also 
uh, tweet to the hashtag, but I'm imagining that the hashtag at the end of the keynote is going to be, and people, my ask mentions might be too many. I'm being very optimistic here, obviously, but I know a lot of my friends tweet, so <laughs> I'm assuming people will, uh, will do that. But um, I thought, you know, quest people can post questions or comments on the slide, and then that way I can respond to those over time, and it could be a conversation that goes on beyond the 35 minutes. Uh, hopefully. So, so that's kind of what I'm hoping for. And we're also doing a virtually connecting session uh, that same day at the second half of lunch. So virtual folks and anyone else who's at the conference who wants to come and listen to that conversation can join that as well. Uh, hopefully, yeah, this is not too overwhelming for people. But anyway, I'm keeping a lot of the content secret, but I've shared little parts of the content with different people. Uh, some who will be at the keynote, some who won't, so people like my mom, and, <laughs> and gotten feedback on them. And that sort of um, helps me like, with, like, with my confidence a little bit. I'm a pretty confident person, but this imposter thing is pretty difficult to, to get over. Um, and then and one of the things that I blogged about uh, was that I wanted to make the keynote some, sort of a choose-your-own-adventure type of keynote and let people work together and do things. And Josie and Alvin and Rebecca and like, Almost everyone was like, Maha, you're all about the inclusion of underrepresented voices. I remember what all was like. I was maybe there were maybe like three people of color in the entire conference, and that's a bigger conference than OER. And they were like, if you're talking about inclusion of underrepresented voices, then interacting with the others in the room is just reproducing the privilege of the white probably the white men, because men are often more confident to speak up, or you know, the more confident people. And so what I was doing is first of all, there's a lot of um, there's, there's a lot of people who are white uh, who are underrepresented in different ways or marginal in different ways or have confidence issues or who, who require help to be included as well. Um, but the other things I've done is, first of all, in my call for ideas for the shirts and trousers um, problem, let me explain that quickly to people who have another blog post. Basically, it's, it's an Egyptian expression that came out of a, a comedy, comedy play where the person is saying, I actually misquoted it. It says, I came to fix my jacket and I spoiled my trousers. Um, and I was, I'm, I was thinking of examples of that that happened with open education that you try to solve a problem and create a new one. And so I asked particular, there are some people who posted their answers as comments on my blog, some who sent them privately, and, and some that I solicited. And I made sure that there was some representation of men and women and people inside and outside the room in that set of people. Um, so I solicited some people who didn't do it naturally. And the other thing is, throughout my keynote, I tried as much, I tried in the beginning, it didn't work very well, but I tried in the beginning to, as much as possible, quote only people who were not normally quoted a lot in these contexts, who were people of color, who were women, who were outside of the US and the UK. And I think I've done a relatively good job with that. I will still end up quoting some other people because they do good work. There's no reason to not quote them just because, you know, just because they have some privilege. But I've learned from them all and, and it's, um, but I also did, did find value in making the effort to find voices that were different from what we were used to saying, seeing, and also from bringing, um, some theory and some ideas from totally outside the FTEC field. So some things that I learned about through my PhD, some things that were shared with me completely outside of the idea of open education or educational technology, um, and to try to bring those in. Um, and still in the end, when, when I talk about all this, uh, even the underrepresented voices that get represented are usually the ones who can speak English. They are usually the ones who have a level of privilege that allows them to be in that third space that can reach more people. Um, uh, so it's, it's, it's never going to be perfect, I think, but I, I try to do that, and I I'll, and I still hope hopefully there'll be still some interaction in the keynote, so it won't be what I didn't want it to be. Um, the other thing I realized, and I don't know if this is the case for other people, and you can tell me in the chat room if you. But when I when I was invited to uh, participate as an as a keynote speaker, I became more confident to participate in conversations that other people were having about open education, which I didn't realize that I was less confident about before. So, for example, there was, I think, a conversation between Jim Groom and Mike Caulfield, and I can't remember who else, maybe Martin Muller. So three pretty big names in the field. I thought something, and I was sort of, I had a, a different view than all of them. And I decided to write a blog post, and a very strong one, and I felt like, yeah, I could I could have, I could have an opinion about this, even if I don't have that experience. I'm, I'm a keynote speaker. They don't know that yet. <laughs> but I can sort of. 
uh, participate in those conversations, and that, that helps me a lot. And when you take that step of participating in a conversation, uh, in the, you know, in that more authoritative way or something, it sort of allows you to take more risks and, and say more than you normally would have and feel like, yeah, I can say something, you should listen to me. Whereas before, I always felt, oh, how nice of you to listen to me. You know, oh, look, Jinkroom retweeted my thing or replied to me. And, you know, I remember I was there like three years ago, and just last summer I co-presented with Jinkroom. So this is kind of one of the, the key things about open and participatory uh, online learning is that you can be nobody. And then within two or three years, you're, you're a keynote speaker, and that's, that's just amazing for me to be here. I still can't believe that's, that's where I've gotten in this very short amount of time. Uh, and I'll share something at the very end also about why that's like a really big deal to me. Um, and again, I'm recognizing my intersectionality in all this. So yes, I'm a woman. Yes, I'm from this part of the world here in Egypt. Um, but at the same time, I have a lot of privilege. Um, I learned, I did my master's online. I did my PhD remotely. So I had a lot of experience working online before I came to this, before I had a blog, before I was open. Uh, and, and, you know, ha having a PhD, having good English, being at an institution that, that is one of the best in my country, all of that is a lot of power that I have. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> and, um, and at the same time, I'm very small in my institution. I mean, people, you know, I, 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 I'm very talkative and friendly, and I've been here for a while, and people like me and everything. But I'm really tiny in terms of the amount of power I have locally. Uh, besides my personality, I don't have a lot of power. I'm, I'm not the lowest person on the ladder, but I'm not very high on the ladder. I'm not tenure track for American institutions, so I'm not tenure track. Um, and I'm at the Center for Learning and Teaching rather than at another department. Yes, I'm, you know, I'm faculty, so that's something good. I teach uh, one course a semester, half a course. Um, but so, and, and so sometimes, you know, I was just talking to uh, Barton and Katie this morning about how a lot of us appear online to be slightly bigger than we actually are in real life. Someone recently, when, when they did the, when there was the laptop ban, um, at, at Global Teacher, I think her name is Lisa, Lisa Tanner, she said, senior academic coming from Egypt isn't going to be able to bring her laptop. I'm like, I'm not senior. I'm like, senior in what way? <laughs> I was like, I, I could be flattered that you think I'm senior as a position or something, or I could be like really offended that you think I'm that old. <laughs> but I don't think she meant it. I think she just meant, you know, I'm keen to speak because she's calling that senior. Um, but, you know, I'm just saying that, you know, in, in my face-to-face -face contact, I'm not that big of a deal. <laughs> so, there's that. And the other thing is, it's very difficult to finish the keynote. I keep changing it every day. Every day I talk to someone, I'll, I'll find something else. She likes saying she thinks women reflect more on the issues of men. Yeah, it's possibly the case. Maybe the men here could share. And Kelly's saying, I think working in the open media science definition has the power. I agree completely. And I think Bonnie Stewart's research showed that, right? She showed you sort of get, you get a new power structure that's semi-parallel. It's not completely parallel because, and it's not completely different. There are some people who are powerful everywhere, but there are a few of us who are very small in our real life context that who get this opportunity um, to do it outside. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So there was Open Learning 17, and that's <coughs> I think coming from Virginia, um, just a, an open online course. Um, and someone told me about it, and I said, oh, do you need someone to facilitate a week? Because now I'm a keynote speaker, I can actually offer that. I can tell, oh, by the way, you know, people think I know something about open, so if you want me to do something, I'll do it for you. <laughs> so it was a very funny um, way of getting in there. And I facilitated a week, uh, co-facilitated a week on open access. Uh, and Charles Bell was one of our guests over the Hangouts for that. And I think Debbie joined one of the Hangouts we did as a global, as OE Global in South Africa, which is another um, open event. Uh, well, and OBS 16 last year, obviously, also. OE Global. So I'm learning every time I get into a conversation about any of these things. I see things on Twitter. I have Hangouts with people. And I learn new things about open that I didn't know about or they changed my mind about something. And I feel like, oh, well, that fits with what I wanted to say. Uh, and I keep adding it, or I realize, oh no, everybody's talking about that, so it's nothing new, so maybe I shouldn't talk about it. Uh, and, and I'm very lucky with uh, virtually connecting, which I, I don't know how many people in the room are aware of virtually connecting. Uh, it's basically a way to, I mean, if you like, if you, if you do, I know some of you do, but it's just a way for people who cannot be at a conference to be able to have conversations with people at the conference virtually via Google Hangouts. So unlike this room, 
uh, where there's a privilege to the person speaking who is me, and everyone else needs some sort of permission, I think, to speak. I'm not sure, maybe you can all speak if you want to, but with Google Hangouts, uh, there's only 10 people, so it's limited in terms of the people there, but uh, usually anyone can speak whenever they want to. Um, and, and virtually connecting, well, we have a presentation on it at the conference, inshallah, and we just published a post on the OER17 blog explaining what it is because one of the barriers to people participating in it, we're trying to make it more inclusive, and one of the barriers is people don't even understand what it is. Or, and I think it was you, Sheila, who was saying on, I think, Martin or Often's blog, that you, that you at first imagined that virtually connecting was just for academic people, and it might be just that we say academic conferences, but we don't really mean that. We just mean edtech education conferences that we go to. And the whole, the whole thing started because I have, because of being a mom of a young child who's older now, but when she was very young, it was very difficult for me to travel and leave her behind or take her with me. Either way, it was pretty complicated. Um, and there were really conferences where I had several presentations with a lot of people that I collaborate with online. And being on Twitter is just wasn't enough anymore. Um, yeah, Sheila's saying that she's like virtually connecting with for the likes of her. And this is why in the blog post we published, um, you mentioned, and you know, we put a, a post, you know, we put, we, I think we embedded it. The last year in Open, Open OER 16, we had one with Catherine Cronin and Jim Goon, where they were sharing uh, these um, headphones. <laughs> and they were, you know, Ka you know, Catherine and Jim, if you've ever talked to them outside of the keynote, or even Jim inside a keynote, they're very informal people. And the people on the Hangout were very informal as well. And because we have virtually connecting at almost as many conferences as we can handle, like for a team of over 100 people. Um, and so whenever someone's going to a conference and anyone else is interested in being at the conference, we get to have these conversations. And so it keeps us all who can participate and anyone else who, who wants to join us up to date with what's going on everywhere. So I don't have to go to a lot of conferences every year to know what's happening, to have my finger on the pulse of something like OER or OpenEd. Um, 16, and I, I didn't have to travel to do that. And that's one of the great things about open, it's a great thing about online, and it has so much power to, so much power, it can be so empowering for those of us who can access it. And the key for, thing that we think about a lot is how do you ensure that those who might benefit from it do have the access to it, kind of like what Teresa was saying at the beginning um, in terms of, you know, the, uh, the goals, I think, of the open ed space, right? Um, and so, if you're interested in participating in virtually connecting at OER 17, whether you're on site, if you're on site, let, let me know, uh, or tweet to be connecting. If you're virtual, this bit.ly, the color, was this the color I gave you, Teresa? Anyway, this is bit.ly <laughs> slash OER 17 VT. Uh, that's just a link to our website, which says which sessions are happening at which time, and there's a sign up form, and you can join particular sessions. That's great. Go ahead, um, yeah, no, the colors changed to the, um, template that we have for the uh, open ed SIG, I'm afraid. So your links are now green from your slides, but that's just the template from um, our, uh, no our, our I, told, I, I wrote it in the chat, so that will be easier for people to click. So those of you who can't make it, you'll find out which sessions we're having with whom. And those of you who are, are, are on site, you can walk in and take a look at a session taking place. Christian is one of our, uh, Christian Frederick who's here with us in the chat is one of our buddies, so is Teresa. Uh, we have sessions with them, we have sessions with Sheila, we have sessions with uh, Martin Coxie, and we have with all the keynotes, and uh, I've invited a lot of other people, and it's okay, some people aren't comfortable with it, so it's totally okay if they don't want to join. Um, but if you're interested, you can join and you can watch both virtually and on site. Uh, and we also have a presentation, so you can also uh, come and listen to the focus groups, you know, the results of the focus groups we've been doing about inclusivity. So it's, a lot of it is relevant to open education in general, not just virtually connecting. So I think it could be beneficial for others. Um, yeah, I have other things. Oops, sorry to interrupt you, Maha, there, but I have to say, virtually connect, virtually connecting as a, as a, as an additional channel within the conference is really, really welcome. It's, you know, I know um, I've spoken to people at Alt about this before, but it, it's just. It's like opening the window to everybody, and it, and it's that sort of informal contact that you have as a result of an inform uh, as of either watching or participating in 
uh, virtually connecting sessions that really helps you uh, extend your uh, learning network and, and understand people and see a different aspect to people as well that makes them, uh, brings them closer. So really grateful to you for um, taking that initiative and making it available. And it's a big team of people. So I co-founded this with Rebecca Hogg and then Autumn Kent became my co-director with us. And we have a large, large team of people. Some of them are very, con very committed. One of them is Simon Enser, who introduced Teresa and me to each other. And he's one of our virtual buddies, actually, for helping make this event to happen. I think one of the sessions, Teresa has Martin Hoxie as the guest and John Robertson, and then I think Simon is the virtual person for that. But uh, Sheila was saying the virtually connecting God is is on the 10. And look what I have. <laughs> I made this. This one is a picture of Rebecca, me, and Martin Hoxie and Martin Weller as all see doing a virtually connecting session. I don't know if it, um, you can see it very well. It's our Twitter picture. And then on the other side, it has the logo. So if you see the logo, we're trying to figure out how to let people know where we are because we don't know where we're going to be on site. But you can speak to the virtually connecting account. Or if you see this logo somewhere, we'll probably do something with it. Um, the other thing is, and while we were doing the focus groups for virtually connecting, a lot of people said, well, people who join virtually get a chance to talk to the keynote speaker uh, in a very intimate environment. And then people who are on site don't get that chance. We've heard that criticism before. Um, but it's, it was elaborated on. And what I was thinking of is I'm going to this event where, inshallah, I already know around 50 people. I know because I counted them because I'm giving them gifts. So I know that there are 50 people on site, at least that I know. That I know not only like they follow me on Twitter, but as in I talk to them, they are, some of them are very close friends, some of them are acquaintances, but I know them. Uh, and then there are other people at the conferences that I don't know that I'd like to meet. And how do I, as a keynote speaker, let people know that I'm accessible to them during the conference? And one of the things I did was make sure that I presented other sessions so that there are smaller groups of people and they feel like they can come closer to me. So other than walking around during my keynote, um, being in two other sessions means that people will have a chance to see me up close and talk to me before or after that if they want it. It ends up being too much of my time that's not free uh, for me to walk around, but it also means um, people will know where I am at any point in time, or at least at some point in time. Um, um, Maha, we just seem to have lost your audio at the moment. And because okay, of the system back. we've got, that it's, back, it's, right? it's back. Yeah, it's back. Yeah, it should just resync. So it'll still be caught in the yeah. recording. Did I talk too much? <laughs> did I talk too much? Which part not did at I, all. Which part did you not hear? <laughs> I, I was oh, what happened? You think really typed, fast. I said, I typed, I, I, I'll tell you why I typed. I typed because I don't know how to say Marianne's name. And so I right. typed it as soon as she came in. I think that's why I lost audio. It's her fault. Can you hear me now? Now, where's, yeah, absolutely. No? <laughs> okay. No worries about pronunciation. I think that's Maureen. It's a, a Maureen? It's oh. like an Irish spelling okay. of Maureen, yeah? Maureen. Yeah. Okay. Maureen. So nice Maureen. Okay. Thank you for that. All right. That's good to know. I'm going to have to tell the virtual buddies who are going to be buddying her session. It's <laughs> uh, a Gaelic name, <laughs> yes. I thought so. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a little joke during the keynote, but you guys can have a preview of it. Christian already knows this, um, but you all usually say my name wrong. My name is not Maha, it's Maha. And it's not difficult to say. It's just Maha. It's just faster and an open vowel sound. Hi, Colleen. Did, did you want to ask something? Okay, I guess maybe not. Um, just see. Uh, yeah, somebody picked a mic up there, but... Okay, well, Pauline, do you want to say something? No, I'm sorry, I was trying to mute my mic because the telephone went. <laughs> I did it the wrong way around. <laughs> okay. Is this Pauline Ridley? That's great. Uh, we all oh, have these names, don't we? Now. I have the same problem with my name as well, yeah. but there you go. We're, I, I, <laughs> yeah, I have you heard me like it with us. <laughs> <laughs> it's the S&D, the Teresa, yeah. Yeah, it yeah, is. But 
Right. Okay, now I'm about to finish, actually. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm about to finish uh, this, and then hopefully you take questions if people have any questions. I'm just, um, I just keep working on this. You know, it just reminds me of the harder work of making open, you know, making culture open more locally. Uh, so I think when people talk about my activism, I think my activism is very incomplete. In that sense, that I, I mean, it's not. I don't want to evangelize for open in ways that don't make sense locally. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why it doesn't always make sense uh, to evangelize for open. But also, it's it's back to what it is about open, you know, open participatory online learning. It's much easier to, to make a difference there. So doing something like virtually connecting was actually much easier for me than to get people here to adopt like an open access policy. I'm still working on it. But it takes so much more time and effort, and there's so institutions are so much more complex. And again, like being not the a person in power, working with the little people to try to make it a big change takes time. But we also have uh, an access to knowledge for development team over here, uh, and they, they do a lot of great work. It's just that we're not always doing the same work. Uh, and so it's always something to think about. And this quote from Sarah Ahmed um, reminds me of why I'm open. And it's that we always need the spaces outside the institutional spaces to be able to talk about the problems that are happening in our institutions. And that's what helps me survive. Like, I wouldn't be able to survive without uh, Twitter and virtually connecting now, because then otherwise I'd be just talking to myself and just discovering that these people exist out there and that I can talk to them. And we are different in so many dimensions, but in our hearts and in our minds, we're, we're very much in the same space. Uh, and, you know, Teresa started this um, just before we went live, I think, talking about what said data is forbidden. And I remember how I felt when the Brexit vote came out. And I remember how I felt when Trump won. And I think I was very much empathizing with what you guys were all feeling at the time. Uh, and yes, of course, my Facebook is pretty filtered. I know one person who voted for Brexit in my entire Facebook feed. Um, Trump is a different story, which I'm not going to talk about right now. but. All of my American friends are, are anti-Trump, obviously, because probably if they, so a lot of the, you know, never mind, let's not talk about that. Uh, but then, <laughs> and then when the laptop ban happened, I had so many offers from people. I, I, I did a hashtag, lend me a laptop. I don't need a laptop, I'm fine. But I was just making fun of what was happening. And it's not funny for other people. I can survive on Google Slides on my phone. But most people who travel for business, whether they're from this part of the world or they aren't, are, are being disempowered by this. And putting the laptop and public and check baggage is, as far as I know, a very bad idea. It could damage, it could get lost, and often gets stolen. So it's not really an option for most people. Um, but I did get a lot of offers for people to Oh, we just lost oh, you temporarily again. again. I hope that's going to come, come back any second. On the day. And uh, there we go. It's resyncing. Um, and Francis is saying that the spaces can always be open. Yeah, yeah. you are indeed. Am I back now? Yeah. I think it doesn't like it when I look at the text chat. When I touch the text yeah. chat, we all wrong. have to. It's not a multitasking. It doesn't understand multitasking. We always have to battle with the, the, with with the bandwidth, <laughs> don't we? There's so many things um, going on. And, and I think that's really thing crucial to what you're saying about <laughs> openness as well, isn't it? We need work. open spaces because we need to be able to be free to think. And, and everybody in the room has reacted to that quotation that you just shared with us. Open spaces matter to us, whether mm. it's blogging in the open, uh, tweeting openly, um, connecting with people. They, they matter because we're human. We don't always want to be it's somewhere that belongs to someone else. Um, and, and I think that's, that's really crucial in what you're saying. And I love this slide, Maha. Sorry, I'm going to pass back to you. No, um, yeah, that, that's just a slide. I mean, there wasn't anything in particular I was going to say about it, except that I keep adding people to it. And I keep realizing that I forgot someone important. Like, I think I forgot Audrey at some point. Like, how could you forget Audrey Waters on a slide like that? Uh, but there's also a lot of people here that you might not recognize, and that's important too, because um, there was, I think, some research, maybe it was Bonnie Stewart, I'm not sure, where people often retweet or um, promote the work of people who are more famous or more known than them. And I think that's, I mean, you know, someone like, oh, she doesn't really need to, to tweet her stuff, she's, she's not enough. 
So there's a lot of people out there whose ideas and thoughts are really, really um, helping you learn. And I think more people would benefit from learning from them, and a lot of them are these um, the pictures on that slide, including colleagues in my face-to-face -face environment on the right, top right over there. And even though a lot of them aren't officially open educators in the ways that we understand them, but they are open educators in different ways, uh, and that matters as well. And some of them are not open for very good reasons, and that has helped me learn a lot too about why I shouldn't be always evangelizing. And I still, I know I still evangelize anyway, but it, it sort of, you know, helps me think about it a little bit more critically and more carefully. And again, a lot of these people who are open, and a lot of people like Trans as well, are very critical about how they're being open. People like Catherine Cohen, and a lot of people on these slides as well are critical of it. Um, and so I just wanted to thank all of them. I feel like I'm doing the Oscars and forgetting someone, but. And this is a preview of, you can't see anything on it now because I, I'm, it's going to publish just before my keynote goes off. And I've got my slides and the video stream and the survey at the end, asking for people's feedback on this link. Hopefully it will work and then it will be easy for people to follow the slides if they prefer that and put comments if they want it to. And I'll stop talking now and listen to you guys. Thank you for having me. Wow. The, the force, the power <laughs> of the person that is Mahabali has just been bestowed upon us. I feel like, you know, I'm still steaming. <laughs> My brain is still steaming trying to catch up with the things that are coming out here. It's just amazing. Thank you so much, Maha. And, and there's so much there as well, sort of watching the chat as it went through and uh, um, listening to you as well. There's so much there that was particularly empowering for people. And uh, and it's great to have that. It's like plugging into a battery. This is what I've been hoping for for OER 17, that I can uh, meet up with that community of individuals. And as you say, we're open in different ways at different times in different contexts. Um, but but we share those important values um, and that we share that commitment to um, education and learning that, it, that goes much more uh, broad than just learning from a particular institution or a particular individual. Um, so it's so great to see Erica then saying, right, I'm a, I am an open educator, now I know what I am. That's wonderful. And uh, yeah, very inspiring. And thank you so much for, uh, for coming today and for leading us through that process you've been um, going through around open I'm going to um, finish us off today just with the um, uh, headlines, really, of who the Open Ed SIG are. We're a special interest group. We're supported by ALT, and without their support, we couldn't organize events such as we're doing today. So uh, very grateful to ALT for, uh, for supporting us. But we are a totally open uh, community. You don't have to be an ALT member in order to participate in the Open Ed SIG. The only um, login you'll ever need is if you wish to post on a forum and really as you can understand that's really just about making sure that we know who we're talking to. Um, but the Open Ed SIG you'll find um, and you'll find with the link as well to our webinar. I'm just going to pop this into the um, chat here. So the Open Ed SIG is totally open. We have a blog. We have um, our webinars. Uh, Deb is in the room here. She helps me sort all of this stuff and uh, has prepared a really nice template for us here in uh, our little community space. I'll just pop that link into the chat there. So do take a look. And that is where under webinars you'll find the recording for today's webinar. Do join us on Twitter and do participate and continue to keep this impetus moving forward for uh, our first year, our, our year of open, because this is where our focus really is. And as I say, we're supported by and very grateful to the support of the Association for Learning Technology and the Alt-C community, uh, Alt community that you'll see, hashtag Alt-C as well on Twitter. So I would ask everybody to play with your emoticons for a minute and choose the applause emoticon to pass our applause on to um, 
Maha, and then I'm going to come around and ask for questions. And I can see we have got some hands raised for questions. So if anybody wants to uh, ask a question, all you'll need to do is to click the talk button on your mic and we'll be able to hear you. But we've got a big round of applause going on in the chat uh, for you. Uh, Maha, thank you very much uh, for everything you've done for us this morning. Just charged us up. It's going to take a while to come down. But I'm not, I'm not planning on coming down. I think I'll stay up here. Let's take a look in the chat and see if we have any questions or queries. And just taking a look back. If you have a question for Maha, do pop it in the chat or just pick up the mic, press the talk button, and you can talk into the room. Some yays and whoops from Wales. Wonderful. I'm glad that I'm glad to see so many people expressing how excited they are about uh, next week's OER 17. I certainly am. I'm not sure, as I'm getting a bit old these days, that I'm going to be able to participate in all the community events, but I'm going to do as much as I can. And I certainly look forward to meeting you in the pers in in person. And uh, same with everybody in the room. Please um, do if you see me, grab and say hello or. Um, Tweet me and uh, you know let's get together, let's get to know each other. And of course, join the Virtually Connect session. Uh, one of those I'll be running, I think Christian's running another one. Yeah, some people saving questions for next week. Um, <laughs> I've got I, I just got a problem that I, I don't know what I did, but I clicked something and I tried to get back into the room chat and I can't see it. Oh, I can see it now. Okay. Can you see it? Yeah. The, the yeah. boxes for the room chat you can literally pick up and, and resize so they're, they're individual to your own machine. So um, you'll, find them under, you'll find it under tools and chat if it has disappeared. I found it now. It was just, oh, I was in the chat, but I was, I was looking at something different than the room. Um, Great. So well, I know there's like a question. Maybe Sheila asking trying to, to be connected. Hi, it's yeah, Francis, yeah. Francis here. Yeah. Oh, Francis, thank you. Yes. E Erica had a hand up, so maybe she'll just ask a question after I've asked mine. Um, Maha, I loved your quote, um, but it really made me think about what an open space is outside an institution because one of the reasons that we speak outside institutions is because we have things to say that we don't feel able to make public and so you know what is an open space it is it you know can it be a private space a semi private space i don't know the answer to that but you might have some thoughts That's a very good question, and I think maybe you're one of the people who thinks about this a lot. Um, and I, I think one one of the small things I'm going to talk about in the keynote is that what the, the keynote title is "Hiding in the Open," and one of the things that hides in the open is a lot of the things that allow us to be open happens in private, and nobody sees it. So um, I'm just going to say this very quickly because Francis is going to ask the question. And the Francis and I have a very individual, private relationship that people in the open don't see. And it allows us, we interact in the open as well on each other's blogs and on Twitter. But there's a different relationship happening beneath that, you know, behind the scenes that helps, you know, um, strengthens that relationship that other people don't see it. And it just happens with a lot of different people in a lot of different ways. And some conversations, for us to really understand each other, to really empathize with each other, are things that I cannot say in the open. But I trust Francis, and I want to tell Francis about that, for example, and this is the only way to do it, and then it enables us to be better together in the open. Uh, and, and there are people who aren't safe at all in the open. We're not all equally vulnerable uh, online. Um, and actually, I was very excited to find that uh, Tanya uh, Zari Elias is using a quote from one of my blogs about that, talking about, you know, we're not all equally vulnerable in the open. Robin DeRosa was recently talking about she had students who were in the witness protection program. And she couldn't ask them to blog online. Like that, that's a really risky thing for them to do, no matter how online you go. go. Um, that, you know, that's not something you to want your students to, to, to say, to do. Um, and then Kate Green also talks about 
things like that, you know, and that private and public and open, they're not, like, open is not the opposite of private. And I, it's a, I actually don't know if I understand exactly what she's saying. I don't know if Christian uh, can type in what he thinks he understands that because they're doing a towards openness session together. Um, but that's, um, that's the, yeah, so. Thank you for for that, and thank you for that great question, Francis, as well. Because there's always a there's always a sort of risk because we perhaps end up talking to so many people about open who have no idea what we're on about that we kind of gloss over the complexities of what we mean by open. Um, and and sometimes I think the feedback we get from people is, oh well, it's all about just sharing everything, putting everything out there. Um, and it's much more complicated than that, really. Um, and I think Catherine Cronin's done some great work on this and the spectrum of open as well. Uh, uh, Christian, sorry, you missed your name being mentioned. You were mentioned as a person running a Virtually Connect session. Um, and, uh, and as a person, I hope that I will actually meet and uh, speak to next week. Um, yes, I, the self-censorship, that's interesting, Sheila, really, isn't it? Because we... You know, we're probably, uh, we probably think about these things um, as we write. Where do I write? It's certainly in the online context. Um, where do I write? Where will I do it? But I, I kind of think as well, we, we think about these things in the physical world, and, and there are things we can probably, parallels we can probably make. Um, so, you know, you may, you may decide where to hold a, a meeting because the actual selection of a physical space may send messages. Um, and, yeah, I think we probably do think about these things without even being aware that we're thinking about them sometimes. So maybe just having that opportunity to talk with others. Um, uh, helps us to clarify what we do when. And, and I'm not a great believer in hard and fast rules either. I, 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 haven't, I haven't found that possible, perhaps because I'm quite an undisciplined person <laughs> I, and I can sort of react, as, as Debbie reflects there, I can sort of just react on the basis of what I'm feeling, instinct. Um, but, yeah, having the chance to express something um, whether it's stop thinking, stop, stop and think and reflect personally about it or to um, have these opportunities to meet and talk really helps. Um, do we have any other questions? Yeah, Francis is ever really enriching the discussion here as well, thinking about the sort of insidious use of power. And, you know, that, that soft power that is uh, rarely mentioned, um, but very important. I'm scanning through the chat, but I'm not seeing any other questions. What I'm hoping is that people actually have uh, made connections through today's session, because within this room today, there are some fabulous, open people um, and some great connections. So, yeah, let's, let's strengthen those connections um, and continue to reach out. And, and that we have that wonderful excitement as well now about next week and I'm so looking forward to meeting everybody. I have to say a big thank you to Martin who, because without his help this morning, Martin Hawksey, we would never have managed to make the recording at all because we were having all sorts of problems with the room when we first got started this morning. So uh, thank you Martin for getting us up and running. Uh, I'm just going to switch the recording off now.